markets have gone better this week because the market started to price out Brexit risk. So this week we've seen sterling have the best month it's had in five years against other currencies. And we've also seen the domestic cyclicals really outperform. So uh, financials and, and domestic cyclicals like house builders in the UK have had a really good month. Um, here you can see the, the Betfair implied odds for Brexit and, and uh, the Remain voters now uh, had quite a big move north towards 85%. Equally, we've had the risk of a liquidity event in Greece uh, come out of the market this week with a 10.3 billion euro tranche uh, delivered to the Greek economy. Um, that um, is, has been well received by markets and equally there is talk of debt relief uh, for the Greek government at the end of this program which is what the market wanted to see, some sort of compromise between uh, the IMF, uh, the EU and, and the Greek government. Uh, in terms of delivering that, that, that austerity program uh, and the funding that is required. Perhaps the most interesting thing this week has been the fact that the market's gone higher as the probability of interest rates have gone up. Uh, so in the US we've had quite a big move in the probability of a rate rise in June, um, but we've also had a really good move in the S&P Banks Index this week. Um, so that suggests that, that, that they f the market feels that the the economy, certainly the US domestic economy, can withstand higher interest rates. Um, equally, at the same time, we've seen the US dollar go up, but the, the, the oil price remain and, and touch $50 a barrel this week. And, and again, that is removing some of the, the concerns of the negative feedback of lower oil and the impact of oil company insolvency uh, on the high yield market, which would tighten financial conditions. So um, you know, that's a very positive development for. Uh, the market because there's a lot of uncertainty about the impact or the effect of higher interest rates and how the market would react to that. Whilst we've seen significant positive developments on a number of fronts this week, China remains on our worry list and the situation in China probably worsened this week. So we continue to see the Chinese total debt to GDP rise uh, and now we're at a level where uh, we're above where Japan was in 1988. Equally, the corporate debt issuance to GDP is 150% versus where Japan was in, in, in 1988, which is 100%. So what we're sort of looking at is, 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 is what's happening to the Chinese currency uh, uh, and whether we're going into a similar scenario that we saw in, in 88 for Japan. So if we go back to revisit what happened there, clearly the Nikkei was extremely weak. It went from 40,000 to 14,000, from 88 to 2,000. Uh, and the yen was extremely weak, devaluing around 30% over that period. So uh, we need to watch that currency and we need to be really alive to the effect of a depreciation of the RMB. Uh, against other global currencies. So the upshot on positioning uh, from this week is that our conviction on UK cyclicals remains you know, strengthened by, by the moves that we've seen in, in the likelihood of a Brexit. Uh, the beneficiaries of, of European benign funding conditions continue to be very attractive uh, and this sort of collaborative um, approach by, by the EU uh, with Greece uh, th further strengthens our conviction there. Um, equally, U.S. domestic earners, um, we've been reassured by the market reaction to higher, the prospect of higher interest rates and um, the feeling that they can absorb those higher costs. We continue to take Chinese exposure out of portfolios and try and insulate it against the Chinese-led market disruption that could still happen as, as these metrics continue to deteriorate. Next week we've got some really interesting companies reporting at Volkswagen on Tuesday, clearly in the eye of the storm over the emission scandal. We've got Wolsey on Wednesday, we've got Michael Kors also on Wednesday. We've also got British Airways or IAG reporting on Friday. Uh, a quick word about the airline industry. We've seen the P&L uh, of the airline stocks transformed over the last couple of years, so the PE of these businesses has fallen very dramatically, as you can see from this chart. Um, we've also seen the dividend yields rise quite considerably in, 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 in this stock particularly. Um, and that's because of change in the composition of the industry. So we've had consolidation and we've moved to an oligopolistic um, industry position 
global market structure, um, particularly in transatlantic, which is where BA operates uh, a significant proportion of their revenues. So because of that new industry structure, the ability to constrain capacity and stabilize the average revenue per seat has really benefited the profit and loss account of this business. Equally on the cost side, we've seen significant replacement of fleet over uh, the last couple of years of old aircraft and uh, the, the capex expenditure of IAG we think will come down quite markedly over the next couple of years as 20% of the market cap has been spent uh, in 2015 uh, which you know, sits um, as, as a sort of exceptional item against the sort of capex that we're seeing in the actual engine manufacturers is probably near a 7%. So we can see, if we can see evidence of stable pricing, capital discipline, falling capex, lower oil price, higher caps, cash conversion, and a policy to pay out that cash to shareholders, then those multiples that, you know, sub-market multiples uh, should start to re-rate.